for you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here and I will just continue where Anna ended. Uh, let's see here. So, this Agenda 2030, it was launched uh, September 2015. It was uh, then adopted by 193 member states. Never had so many head of government met before at one place. The re it really meant business. It was much higher level. It was on the head of government level, not on the environmental ministry level. It was involving a great number of organizations to prepare for this. So it is much bigger thing, actually, than the Millennium Goals they replaced. Uh, this summer, it was again a high-level political forum in New York where uh, the member states present the progress in this work. And this year, Sweden was one of the 44 countries presenting. I was part of this uh, delegation. And, uh, so, and it is really on high level when people talk about it, discuss it, and it is, it, you got a feeling that it is important, really important, this journey. It is becoming more and more important. It's not only, or maybe not, the most important thing is environment. It maybe is social aspect, that is, how can we live together? That kind of issues, that is on the top agenda in these meetings. And, um, in the Agenda 2030, you can r recognize three keywords, and I would say they are really capturing what it is all about. One is what uh, already been said, transformation or transition. Something old has to disappear, and something new has to uh, evolve. It is a transformation of system after system not only transportation system, but energy system, but also some kind of wel some welfare system and other system. And we are, the problem here is that we are used to run this kind of system, and now how could, we don't know, it is uncertain, this, this journey, how to deal with that. So that is one, integration is the other, and that is integration in two aspects. One is that we cannot work with first, ecological aspect of sustainability, climate, and then social aspect. As Anna said, when it comes to electric car, for example, one um, important aspect is the, who can access the street in the future. And that is a social aspect, as important as the climate aspect. And the other is, pro uh, probably we cannot solve this alone. We have to find new ways to work together, or even co-create together. And then it's universality leaving no one behind. It's not enough to solve the problem here, it has to be solved everywhere if we want to reach sustainability. So those are good, three really good keywords. And when it comes to transformation, we have seen it before, from low if intensity, low efficiency, low material growth, agriculture system, into high intensity, very low efficiency, take, make and waste industrial society with high material growth. And you all have seen those, the, uh, the pictures from 1900 where you couldn't even spot a single car even it, if it, it was uh, actually developed before, 85, called horseless carriage because you couldn't imagine a car or something with four wheels without a, a horse connected to it. And then we have the T4. And at that time, a lot of people were occupied, still occupied, thinking how can we improve this system. And just a few years later, you couldn't spot a single uh, horse on, in the streets. So the transformation worked quite quick. And it was the same in Paris and New York. And this is actually I, I, what I think will happen once again. It is a transition, transformation into something new. With high intensity, of course, 10 billion people, high efficiency, very much higher efficiency, and, and th th therefore much lower material growth in that society. And it's already happening. And I will not go into this because that it, it will be your seminar today. But it, you, you see the, the speed of what, what, what's actually happened. And the performance. I think that my grandchildren will ask me, how many driving lessons did you take, you said? Why? To start the engine in a hill? 
<laughs> Why? <laughs> Why was that necessary? I don't, I, I don't understand. Why didn't you use just, uh, or, you know, you understand. And everything else that will disrupt the system. And um, digitalization is probably underestimated both in its speed and its, in, in its magnitude. And this is a graph of the magnitude of potential change to the energy demand for different sectors, transport, building and industry, and the barrier for that uh, digitalization. And you see here that uh, in this OECD uh, IEA report from this year, mobility is in the top right corner, both in magnitude and in difficulties. And I think, therefore, we have to think about innovation in a different way. We used to think about innovation as we, g we have some great idea and it's, it has to reach the market. That is a problem. How can that happen? And we develop a system for that, entrepreneurial thinking. And if you're really clever, we think outside the box. And then we have understood that we need to go out there and understand what is actually the need in society and develop based on that need, and that called for design process in, instead of this idea-driven process. And there, many in industries are in that position right now, but since we have a system that has been existing for a very long time, we are in a social sec uh, a technical system that is have quite strong lock-in effects. When it comes to knowledge, it is diesel engine that we know in Volvo very much. It's technology or market legislation, policy and culture and, and norms. Keeping it as it is. It's not just to push out an idea in that system and think that it will change. Because so many aspects need to change for it to actually diffuse and evolve. And what is happening now is that the, the requirement for sustainability is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer and more and more urgent, especially in cities. And that means if you can understand those requirements, as Anna said, if you can have ca some kind of clear understanding, not of a, a detailed vision, but the guiding principles, at least, for that future, that can help us for another process of innovation where we have the uh, principles here in the future and today's situation that do not really fit in that future. We understand that there is a gap between what we want and what we have. And that gap will be then the input for innovation. And that will be a challenge-driven or sustainability-driven innovation process. And in that, it is about rather, um, it is about thinking how the box needs to change rather than thinking outside the box. And we have to think together here. What kind of system change needs to be done in knowledge, technology, market, legislation, pol policy, and culture norms to make that future happen? And then I think backcasting is a very natural logic to think when it take that innovation into consideration. If we have the idea-driven innovation based on entrepreneurial thinking and the demand-driven innovation based on design thinking, I think the challenge-driven innovation or sustainability innovation is very much based on backcasting. And backcasting is that you start in the future. You start in the future and try to understand what that future will imply. And then you look at the today's situation and look at the gap between. And that gap will influence the design process for the future. You look for leverage point to begin with to see where to intervene in the system and then go for that and develop solutions and then try to find ways to realize those solutions. So it, there are three spaces for change as I see it. One is humanity. How can we actually make this happen? What does it mean, this sustainability transition? How, what would, would the guiding principle look like for the transport system? And here it's very much about staying in the question, not running for solution. We have so many events when we meet and have post-it notes and run for solution. We have to have meetings where we stay in the questions and really try to understand what can we agree upon when it comes to guiding, guiding principles. Special events for that, that I think. And uh, the starting point might be the Grohan uh, Brundtland report about the needs in the future and the needs today. It's about well-being in the future and well-being today. 
and it's about not uh, it's about making it possible to have well-being in the future and therefore we have to be we have to look for uh, possibility to, to save social system, economic system, and natural system for the future generations. And there are some generic questions you can ask. One is, of course, to start with, what characterizes a good life in the future when it comes to needs, rights, and well-being? And how can we fit society within the current capacity of nature when it comes to emission, land area manipulation, and so on? And there you can develop principles for all those. And the social aspect is about how on earth can we live together? How can, we, uh, how can trust be kept or developed between us and also in the vertical direction uh, among us and those who decide? And it's about equity, distribution of goods and the bad things. And economy is about how can, we res how can resources be saved for the future. It's about energy and materials, the cyclic society is here, uh, or cyclic economy, but it's also about knowledge and money for the future. And that is a starting point for thinking about this. And you can, of course, relate the system, uh, 17 development goals to this, but if you take one, it, sustainable cities, for example, it, it actually have social, economic, and natural and well-being aspect in that goal. So maybe this structure can be used for every, every goal in, as a starting point. And the power of guiding principles for transition is very well sh shown by this man. He had some guiding principles. Live equal rights, no violence, and then he practiced that in reality. So what he did actually was to have guiding principles and then testing, testing, testing in reality. And his biography was called Experimentation with Truth. So the guiding principles were always there and they were tested in the salt mars and so on. So that is an example of transition based on guiding principles. And there are good examples also from business sector and other sectors. And I think the guiding principles have to be some kind of idea of what you want to, uh, to happen in the future. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He never said, I have a nightmare. It, that was not a starting point for the journey. And I think that is very much what we, what we have the, the problem with sustainable development to a large degree. We, we have to attract people to this journey. And the next space for change is how we work together. Uh, sorry. Uh, and uh, integration. And then it is very much about collaboration is built on trust, to dare to make mistakes together. And for that we need to understand and listen to each other, and then that is created. We often do not listen, and there is a lack of trust, and that means leads to redundancy, increased, s the same thing is done in many places, increased cost, decreased resources, internal competition, and fear and separation. So, to create in this atmosphere is important, to create a space for change. And the last thing is us as humans. We have to understand that we are a part of the system that needs to change. That means that we have to challenge our assumption in that meetings, we have to challenge our will to understand other people, and we have to challenge our courage to dare to take a step into that uncertainty, I think. So, you can actually conclude with think big, start small, act now, and do mistakes often. Learn fast. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you.